you know, it's going to be quite an informal session today. Um, and feel free to ask questions as you go along. Um, it's good if everyone can keep themselves on mute just to avoid any feedback, but obviously um, unmute yourself if you need to ask any questions or if you've got anything to say. Um, and just to remind you, we will be recording um, the webinar um, and we'll have it up online um, and send you the link. But um, if you don't want your faces or your names um, kind of coming up, just kind of don't switch your video on and maybe take your name off, off the video. Um, yeah, and if there's any problems um, and you you um, you need to rejoin, just try the link again, and you can give Maggie a shout um, if there's any problems. Um, so yeah, just go through the agenda quickly. Um, we're just going to kind of give you an introduction to the Turvey Cymru scheme, um, which is funding this training um, today. Um, Sarah Gould from Lantras here and Nick Perkins, who works with social, social farms and gardens with myself. Um, then Tony Little, um, he's going to do a bit of an introduction to CSA principles. Um, he's joining us from Land Workers Alliance today. Um, Tom O'Kane um, from Kaitan CSA down the Gower is just going to give a quick background introduction to um, Kaitan. Um, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask some questions as well. Um, and then um, Tom and Tony are joining us as the expert panel and will give us some good insights um, as, uh, as we go along. Um, I will stop sharing our, my screen now. Um, yeah, so I'll pass you on to Nick. Um, and Sarah, um, Nick, do you want yeah. to start? I was just going to say, don't please um, don't feel that you have to leave your video on for the entire session. It would be good if you're talking um, at all to to have your video on, so we know who we're talk you're talk we're talking to. But otherwise, please feel free to kind of relax and absorb. If you need to leave at any time for school pickups or anything, then again, we are recording the session and we'll post it so you'll be able to, to catch up with the rest of the session. So, um, OK, in terms of um, introductions, I'm going to hand straight over to Sarah Gould, who um, is uh, our partner at Tuvy Cymru. Um, and yes, and is funding the project. So, Sarah. Thanks, Nick. Oh, sorry, bear with me two seconds. How's that? Oh, thank you. Um, I, can you see that? You have you got two screens, Sarah? Because we've got your slide sorter rather than the main display. Oh, hang on. The joy of share, making sure you're sharing the right mm. screen. It's quite temperamental, Zoom. Um, I did forget to mention as well, because I know that there's a few of you um, based in England um, that have joined us, and thank you for joining. Um, there is a bit of a Welsh slant to this um, because it is funded through the Tevi Cymru scheme. Um, so yes, um, most of it will be generic, but we will be pointing you towards some, some support and some of the support that we can offer that, um, will be specific yes, that's right, Sarah. to okay. the Welsh CSAs as well. Okay, very, very briefly, just thank you, Nick. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me just to give a very quick overview. Um, I'm Sarah Gould, I work for Lantra, and we run the Tuvy Cymru uh, Horticulture Project in Wales. And we're really delighted to be able to support um, social farms and gardens in this work, continuing the um, existing work they've always done on CSAs. We've worked together now for a number of years we're clear on there's a distinction between commercial and community the CSA sits between us so it's great that we're working together on it but I think it might be just worth highlighting what we do in terms of the project because there might be some overlap and some resources that you can access 
Um, so Tumpy Cymru is a um, European funded project through Welsh Gov and it super supports the commercial horticulture sector in Wales. I would say one of the benefits of lockdown and going online is that all our project resources are open access so are available to all. So I'll just bring up the web website briefly for you at the end. Um, we cover edibles and ornamentals and it's all 100% funded training. Um, and we do a lot of work through networks. So these are some of our more popular networks. Um, you know, there's been a massive growth in terms of pick your own pumpkin and pick your own soft fruit. So they're quite popular networks. Lots of people looking at opportunities in, in uh, Welsh grown flowers as well. Um, so those are the website details. If you want to find out more or want to email us direct, if there's any other uh, ways in which that we can support you. Um, and if I can just... Um, Can you see the website there as well? I just pulled up those to show you. So we last January, we were lucky enough, um, Ben Hartman was talking at um, the Oxford Real Farming Conference. And we were asked by his publisher if he could do an event in um, Wales. So Tom agreed that he could come down to Kai Town. We had a really useful day's work down there. And then we continued working with Ben and he's delivered several webinars for us. And he's done a couple of toolkits that are all on. So if you go into that area in the Knowledge Hub, you might just find something that's of use. And I hope you uh, enjoy your session this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Fab. So just to give a little bit of background to Social Farms and Gardens. So both myself and Sarah work for Social Farms and Gardens um, and we're hosting the session today. This is part of our community supported agriculture project. Um, we are able to offer one-to-one -one support and group training like this afternoon for anybody that's interested in setting up a CSA in Wales. So for those of you that are across the border, um, the support would be available if you were looking to set something up in Wales, but otherwise it's great that you're here and joining us this afternoon anyway. So make the most of uh, Zoom training while we're all still delivering it. So in terms of the project, um, there's we like a, a, one of the baselines in terms of receiving support is be able to sort of actively demonstrate your working towards a commercial business. So business planning is one of those initial sort of hurdles that you need to have put some thought into to be able to gain and uh, access additional mentoring. So we wanted to host the session this afternoon to make sure that nobody found that part as a, as a barrier. So um, in terms of the, the support that people are able to receive is very much tailored. Um, Sarah would be the first point of contact and she would do a little bit of a sort of diagnostic as to where you are and then be able to, to match you up with specialist mentors based on your geographic area and also your, your needs and wants. So um, I think the best thing, if anybody is interested in that, is to um, contact Sarah after, and I'm sure we'll be sharing contact details, if not just pop it in the chat or something. Um, in terms of social farms and gardens, like Sarah mentioned, uh, community supported agriculture is something that we've been working to support and promote for a number of years. Um, we have a number of projects that are running to support other types of community growing um, and we will be starting a new project in April that will be funded by RDP um, under the Enabling Natural Resources and Wellbeing funding stream. And a couple of the key sort of work package strands on that will be around increasing um, the allotment provision across Wales. We'll be doing work around orchards um, and greener verges. There'll also be opportunities to generate um, and create food hubs um, in certain geographical locations to promote, promote short supply chains. And there will be work around looking at skills for future farmers as well and horticulture. 
um, and potentially some land acquisition. So that's all a, a case of watch that watch this space. Um, and there's opportunities on the Social Farms and Gardens website to sign up as a for a free membership. Um, and then you can stay up to date with where we are and what different types of projects um, and support we're able to offer to community um, and nonprofit organizations and groups. Um, so that's Social Farms and Gardens. Just to mention as well, um, a partner on the project who's not here today is the CSA Network UK. Um, it's definitely worth having a look at their website. Um, they have an amazing suite of resources on um, to support community supported agriculture. And one of their main um, uh, resources is called the A to Z. We will actually be take, um, publishing that later in the year as a Welsh specific version. And we'll be adding in a couple of additional sections, one on planning in Wales and also one on sort of cropping and, and growing tools as well. So, and there may well be hard copies available. So again, watch this space. Um, one thing I forgot to mention as well is we all, Social Farms and Gardens also hosts the Community Land Advisory Service. Um, at a completely free service to help um, community groups to access green space um, and land for, for growing. And we are able to support um, in terms of identifying land and also in terms of negotiating with landowners and um, in terms of the leases and licenses that you might be looking at. So that's a, a completely free service as well. So again, we'll put some details in the chat um, for anybody that might be interested in that. Okay, so just to get started for today's session, uh, we'd like to know a little bit about you, which you've obviously done already in the chat and the introductions, that's brilliant. But I'm just going to ask you two quick questions as a poll. So the first one is we'd like to know what stage your CSA is at at the moment. So it, this is a completely anonymous poll. So please feel free to answer honestly. So is your CSA just a dream? Are you pre-start, but slowly moving forwards? Have you just started? Are you running, have you been running for less than a year? Running for a year, sort of a year to two years, or are you established and looking to grow and diversify? And just give a moment for that. Right, so there's a lot of people that are dreaming about setting up an enterprise, which is fantastic. Um, we've got to start somewhere, and I'm sure Tom can remember back to those days. A <laughs> um, couple of people pre-start and somebody has just started, which is fantastic. Um, so I will just end my second poll. Uh, just share results. And in terms of today, what do you want to get out of today? So do you, are you just sort of finding out for the future? Are you new to this and need all the help you can get? Uh, are you just starting to plan and need some support? Or are you looking to improve and revise an existing business plan? Okay, so lots of people just thinking about finding out what's there for the future so they can put their dream into context, I guess. Um, and then a couple of people are new, starting to plan or looking to improve. So you're certainly in the right place. Right, so I'm going to hand over now, please, to Tony. Um, who's going to give you a little bit of an introduction to the principles of community supported agriculture. 
Oh, great. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, yeah, today we're going to spend most of the time on the nuts and bolts of business planning, but just as a bit of scene setting, really, um, just really talk a little bit about um, what CSA is uh, and what it aims to do. And I'll just give you a little bit of background about where we are in Wales in terms of development of the, um, of the, the, the sector or the movement. Uh, I mean, CSA is actually built on one very simple idea. And that idea is that it's a partnership between food producers and the local communities and that the risks and the rewards of food production are shared between the producer and the community and, 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 and the group. So it's a radical change in the sense that most food transactions are contractual. So as a producer, you provide a certain amount of money in exchange. Uh, you, you, you provide a certain amount of food in exchange for a certain amount of money. And that's the beginning and end of it. Um, CSAs, um, it's an acknowledgement um, that at the moment, all of the risk of food production is borne on the shoulders of the producers. As a consumer, you still get the same quality and the same quantity of food regardless of what's happening on the farm and CSA acknowledges that actually um, food production is quite difficult and it's quite risky and society benefits uh, every bit as much as best producers and in fact if we have society that has uh, that, that doesn't have a secure food supply that society is in deep deep trouble so it's an acknowledgement uh, of how important food producers are and it's a way uh, in which those producers can be supported. Um, now, people quite often ask me whether they're allowed to do certain things uh, as part of a CSA uh, or whether they can do certain things as, as part of a CSA. And I think my answer is usually it's kind of up to you how you achieve that goal of setting up a partnership of risk sharing between your communities. Uh, and you as a producer is really up to you. And there are no rules. Um, you just do it in the way that you think best uh, suits you. So I will say very quickly the ways that many CSAs manage this. And certainly the issue of risk sharing is usually uh, that community uh, members sign up to the scheme and they pay a fixed amount over a fixed period. Um, and quite often, that, um, that fixed period is a year, and more often than not, uh, it's a monthly payment. So usually a member will pay whatever it is, um, 50, 60 pounds a week by standing order um, throughout, 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 throughout the year. In a few cases, uh, people are able to pay for all of the money up front, uh, and, and, and that's great, but the principle is it's a regular payment uh, for which you receive a share and that share will go up and down in terms of its value uh, and its range um, and as a, as a consumer, as a member, you're saying that's okay, I'm committing to you. Um, in terms of uh, how the relationship is, is built, uh, usually members have some kind of involvement um, in the business. And quite often that's uh, volunteering days or working on the on, on the farm for a bit uh, or perhaps getting involved in some other aspects of the, the project. So, for instance, quite a lot of CSA members help the business with things like accounting and marketing and uh, social media and, and, and all those sorts of things. So this is quite often members are making some kind of contribution um, to the business. Nearly always, uh, there's a social element um, to CSA, and I think that's a really fundamentally important part of, um, of building that relationship and that partnership. Um, so quite often that's harvest parties, um, I don't know, value added processing days, making cider or pickles or, or whatever it might be, but it's something that brings your members uh, onto the farm and it's it's an opportunity for people to get to know each other and actually build meaningful relationships um, 
so as I say, that's broadly speaking what what what, what CSAs are are about. I, I say again because it comes up time and time again. There are no hard and fast rules about how you do this, but as long as you're building close relationships and, and relationships based on partnerships between yourself and the community, and you're sharing that risk um, between yourselves and your community, um, that's really all you need to achieve uh, to, 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 to be a CSA, so to speak. Um, I'll just say a couple of words just to set the scene uh, in terms of the movement in Wales. So I think there are probably about a dozen um, CSA schemes that identify themselves as such in Wales at the moment. They're mostly horticulture, but there's probably another 30, 30 or 40 um, projects who are very much in that area. They may not identify themselves as CSA, but they're doing a lot of the things that I have just mentioned. Um, I think in terms of future development, I would really like to see that number grow. But actually, I would also like to see the people and the groups that engage with that. So at the minute, uh, it's mostly individual families buying shares. I would love to see us move up another step. So businesses, whether that's cafes um, or restaurants or food service um, businesses, whenever they're allowed to open up, um, can buy shares in CSAs. And ultimately, I would love to see schools and hospitals and care homes also buying shares in CSAs. Um, so I think in, in summary, it's a small um, movement in Wales at the moment, but it is really growing. Um, we do, in the shape of people like Tom, who's just going to talk now, have some really successful uh, examples. And I think that's really inspiring. Uh, and I'm sure you'll go away from today having heard about Tom feeling really inspired. Um, so. That's all, I, that, that's all from me for now. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'll pass you on to Tom now. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, I'm just going to share my screen and just do a, a brief introduction of what we're doing at Kaitan and um, very briefly sort of explain about, you know, why we did a business plan and very briefly kind of have a quick look at our business plan, although it's just to give you a kind of very brief picture of what it contains. <coughs> so I think my screen should start sharing. So can people see that? Yes, that's great. All right, so yeah. Um, yeah, so we're based on the Gower Peninsula, just outside Swansea, and we're coming into our seventh season at the moment. And um, we grow for 130 households um, through COVID. Actually, that's we've got a big waiting list that's kind of built up. So we've got another 100 households on a waiting list. And um, yeah, I'd say actually, even though we're in our seventh year, we've been going eight years. And I think that's quite important to say we spent a whole year um, just setting the project up before we even actually produced anything. Um, we, we're lucky that we're close to a really big population. And currently we're made up of uh, two growers who we both work pretty well full time in the summer months for like six months of the year. And then we both go down to two, three days a week over the winter months. And um, we also have someone working on admin and membership. And I think she's pretty much a day a week all year round. And then we now have as well a schools officer who works um, probably a day to two days a week most of the year on engaging local primary schools and whatnot. And then we've got through the summer months, which are our really busy time, we have lots of volunteers. And I'd say in the winter, we have a lot of volunteers as well, but it's really, we find like a lot of our volunteers drop off. They kind of disappear for the winter period and then they come back as soon as the sun comes out. So this morning we were harvesting and um, we must have had about six or seven volunteers who showed up for the morning. Uh, so that that's a really lovely side of CSA, I think. And then we have trainees. So we have every year we've had at least one trainee that's been funded through the Rural Development Programme or through Kickstart this year. And then we've had other schemes in the past, government schemes that have 
paid for trainees to come and join us. So we're going to have two trainees this year and we're going to be sharing the third trainee with another business. So she's going to be dipping in and out of what we do. And then we're also hosting European volunteers. So we'll have two European volunteers. So over the summer, we'll really be like quite a big gang of us there four days a week. There'll be um, six of us on site plus any number of volunteers. Um, so yeah, what we do, we basically grow food all year round for the 130 households. We, we're training up new growers. So I can, I, I'll brief, briefly fly through the, the trainees we've had with us so far and what they've gone on to do. Um, but we basically realized that actually it's working really well for us having trainees. And actually we want to concentrate on supporting more groups to set up. So we've basically set up a CSA training program, which is going to start from this October and it's going to run through the winter each year to enable people who are sort of with the, who have got the growing skills to um, to really look at how what other skills they need to get together in order to set up a CSA and kind of start them on that route of basically gaining all those skills and ideas. Um, so that's one element of what we do. Um, we're working as part of an all Wales horticultural training as well, working with about 20 trainees across Wales this year between five farms to train train people up in basic horticultural skills. And um, we're mentoring lots of organisations, lots of CSAs, and um, we're working still on our schools programme. So as soon as basically Jesse can get back in the schools, there's a lot of COVID restrictions, then yeah she'll be she'll be back to delivering the schools program so i'm just going to show you then if this will work yeah so basically i was just going to run through our trainees that we have had so in this picture lizzie on the left came and joined us well seven years ago when we were first starting up she came from a, like a business and finance background she just finished a degree and uh decided that it wasn't the wasn't the world for her and applied for a trainee post with us and she's basically stayed with us ever since and um is just like a real asset to everything we do and then ruth on the right she was our most recent trainee last year and she's gone on to get a job with a project a box scheme in the south of england francesca was our second trainee she's kind of stayed with us she's leasing a piece of land just alongside us and she runs a salads and greens business that she sells to local businesses. And that's working really well for her. She, she pays herself a near full-time wage for about six or seven months of the year. And then she kind of closes the project down and or kind of keeps it on tick over through the winter period and does other things. And then we have Abby, who is with us, um, our third trainee, and she's gone on to set up a CSA just down the road from us on a neighbouring farmer who'd kind of been watching how we were working and really liked the idea of CSA and um, basically offered us some land to set up another CSA. So Abby came forward and said she'd like to do it. And so we've supported her sort of financially and physically and um, just just in a mentoring sense, really. And she's, yeah, she's now taken on 70 households and is running a yeah, a CSA that's working really well. And then um, I was just going to go on briefly to show you our, our business plan, because I mean, I know when I when I first started up, I kind of the reason we went ahead and started creating a business plan was because one of our funders asked us to. And it was something that personally, I I didn't really I'd never made a business plan before. <clears throat> and I just, um, to be honest with you, I just thought, oh, that sounds incredibly boring. I don't really want to do a business plan. But this funder stipulated that if we were going to gain access to their funds, which might actually be quite a serious income for us to develop social projects for a number of years, they wanted to see a, a comprehensive business plan. So I just went away and looked at what business plans were out there and, um, and then just modelled this one around it. And I'd say actually having done it um, and once I got involved in it and started developing it, I realized then basically the value of doing it. I don't think I had valued how useful it was to have a business plan, but um, once I started developing it, 
um, yeah, I realized that actually it basically answers in your head, you've got kind of a basic idea of how things are going to work. And um, that's on, on a, that's of, often very sort of vague and possibly quite a hopeful idea that doesn't necessarily take into account the realities and risks of it. So I think the process of going through and creating a business plan really pulls out your ideas and tests how realistic they are and whether, yeah, you know, whether they're going to really work once all this starts out on the ground. And it enables people like this funder or people lending you money or even members who are thinking of joining. I think it just, it makes people realize that, yeah, you've got a serious idea and it is valid. So I'm just going to quickly scroll down through this business plan um, just to show you the main content of it. So it's basically um, a background to what your project is. And I would say, um, yeah, it's basically just a simple background to what, what is your idea? Um, who's your market? This is how we've set out ours. We'll be going through in more detail afterwards, different styles of business planning. Um, what's your unique selling point? And then we looked into demand which I think I'll go into a bit more later, but I'd briefly say that when, when we started up here, I think, I think there was fairly obvious demand that something like that, that there would be demand for something like this, but just going out and making some very simple surveys using organizations locally and just using like a survey monkey to do a basic survey, that filled us with a lot of confidence that our idea was really wanted. There was really a, a clear market out there straight away. We could see that. Um, so that was really valuable in itself just to prove that even though we were telling the funder there's a market out there, we didn't have any concrete evidence of that until we started doing this bit of research. Um, and then we just basically set out what is CSA within the UK and within Europe. And then we talked through how we would manage ourselves. Um, so our, our governance, what that would look like, what our aims would be as a group of directors. And then this was even before we'd really formulated exactly what our group, who our group was. At the time, there were three of us. Um, well, myself and three other people who I invited to be involved. Um, and I'd say that's another key thing when you're starting up choose just you know a few people who have got the skills which you haven't got you know there was I, I recognized that there was different elements of this project that I didn't really have much knowledge of developing so then I brought together people who I'd sort of got to know and trusted and respected their ideas and brought them in as the initial initial sort of core group of directors and they weren't necessarily, well, one of them didn't stay on and that was kind of expected that they would move on, but actually the, other, the others have stayed on. And we've kind of continued to build our core in that way that we've just, um, yeah, we kind of pull in from the pool of our membership now, if we identify someone within our membership who we think would be really valuable to the healthy running of the CSA, we'll invite them to come and be, to be, to be part of the core group. So that's one element of it is um, looking at your core group and then deciding what your legal entity is going to be like and kind of talking through that and explaining that within the business plan. Um, and then we spoke about our educational work, how volunteers would be engaged. We looked at our insurance, health and safety risk assessments. So again, having to do all of this and put it into a business plan, it kind of put us in a position because we'd looked at all our volunteer, how our volunteering would work, how our policies would work, what our health and safety risk assessments would look like. It meant that we were kind of, we were up and running and we were ready to go once we had this business plan. It answered a lot of questions of things that were quite vague to us up until that point. And then we did a kind of marketing and sales strategy, um, which again, you know, titles like this, marketing and sales strategy, they sound complex and before I thought oh you know I've never done a marketing and sales strategy but all it means is you're thinking about how you're going to sell this idea to your members and how physically 
that's going to happen and just putting that down on paper to explain it clearly to other people. Um, so just I'll just go a couple more minutes to the end and then I'll pass over. And then, yeah, I wrote about social benefits and their use in the marketplace, pricing strategies. So we kind of just looked at other CSAs, what they were doing, um, and then a SWOT analysis. So we tried to look realistically at what were the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, and yeah, really important to look at those threats. You know, what realistically could really go wrong in the early stages and in and in the more long-term stages of the project. And then key to all of that uh, was the financial side of it. So then we number crunched and basically just worked out what all the setup costs would be um, you know, you know, everything from seeds to compost, to insurance, to water costs, to employing staff. Um, yeah, everything, everything we could possibly think of. Um, and I think basically I worked with our other directors on that. So I put together everything I could think and then each of them would pull it apart and add in anything else they thought. And then we'd, as as most, you know, it's, it's very vague. Again, when you start up, it's very difficult to know a lot of these costs. I think it becomes more clear now that there's a lot of CSAs out there who you can take examples from. But at the time we were pulling figures out of the air. So, you know, we had to be just as realistic as we possibly could be. Um, and, and yeah, I've got to say, actually, when we looked back on our predicted costings that we ran I think I did like a five year costings. I mean, the first five years pretty much ran to plan for how we'd, I was surprised at how close our, um, our predicted costings were to reality. So again, I think, yeah, I just say, I'll, I'll finish up there, but I just say that actually it is an incredibly, incredibly valuable process to put together a business plan. And I think it'll give you a lot of um, well, a lot of security in in your idea, and it allows other people to sort of feel really confident in supporting your idea and financing it. So yeah, I'll pass back over to Sarah from there. Thank you. Oh, I'm I'm taking this section. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tom. That's brilliant. Um, and yes, a really, really good overview for what we're sort of trying to achieve um, as a result of today. Um, I mean, the rest of the session is going to be focusing a little bit more on the business plan template, but just over to you, to everybody, um, are there any immediate questions that people would like to ask at this point, uh, specifically if, um, if there's anything you'd like to sort of get from Tom's personal experience? Oh, yes, Joanna? Hi, uh, thank you. I actually wrote, uh, put my question in the chat. Um, so I'm at the moment uh, working, uh, just receiving a m memo of understanding with the council for a group of um, uh, residents and stroke volunteers to work on the land as a community garden. And actually most of what we call a garden is, is actually veggie growing, food growing space. And so I've been thinking about um, growing the food for local schools and also for um, the local community um, of food uh, that where they cook hot meals for um, the vulnerable uh, population and also have just uh, local schools children coming in to learn about uh, growing food and maybe for them uh, for uh, maybe the uh, the case that the chefs in the school to use the local garden uh, food to cook for the children or, or for part of their kind of um, uh, learning uh, as part of their P, I think it's PSHE learning. So, but I don't know what's the legality there on um, establishing a CSE on a council owned land. And that's in England as well. I'm, I'm so sorry, that was really long way around the question. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I've I'll hand over to back over to Tom in a second. I know that there are certainly some restrictions if you're trying to sell produce from council owned allotments, but I would imagine that it would um, be in the detail of, of the lease agreement that you have with the council and whether you're allowed to um, 
sort of benefit uh, use the produce in that way so yeah I mean, I mean I'm sure Tony would have ideals on this as well but I would say I can't see there'd be any problem I mean I know in Swansea here of one council a bit of land where a CSA is currently potentially being set up and also in Hereford there's a really large CSA in South Hereford which the council are currently sort of handing over I think about 18 or 19 acres to develop so I, I don't know of any issues but I don't know whether Tony knows any different. Uh, no I mean I um, I think that actually um, increasingly that's a very quite a common situation. One of the big problems uh, that you will find starting up a CSA is getting land on the edges of settlements and that's really difficult and quite often that land is actually owned by the council whether it's been council farms um, and one of the really important um, political or strategic aims we need to work to is encouraging councils to make that land available for people who are growing for the benefit of their local communities so I think I not only do I think there shouldn't be any problems I think actually it's a really fantastic and positive Thing. Um, I think that possibly in that situation, I think your challenges will be more around the procurement system that schools uh, use to procure their food. I think that that will be uh, a much bigger challenge for you. But, you know, if you can make that work, that's a truly wonderful thing because you've got the opportunity there for kids to um, come and see the place where their food is produced and actually get involved in the production of their vegetables and Tom has a lot of experience of this you know you know making making their own pizzas from uh, from food that they've learned to grow when you're holding so I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. That's amazing thank you so much Tony and Tom. Okay, you've got another question in the chat from Murray. Um, it says, in Carmarthenshire, we are having dreadful problems trying to get land for community growing. Um, they do not see the value of land as a community asset, only of monetary value. Um, so, Tony and Tom, have you had sort of experience of, I mean, are there any clauses that people can use in terms, try, in terms of trying to make land affordable? rather than just seeing the pound signs and the opportunity of selling it? I'd say, um, yeah, I think I think it's just a matter of trying to just keep generating that discussion with the local council, because we've had similar issues here. You know, we'd like to, we've had funding from Natural Resources Wales to support the setup of a CSA in Swansea East, and the council actually owns quite a lot of land, but is really very, very difficult for them to, um, partly to know even what leases they, what lease agreements they've got on various pieces of land. It seems like quite mysterious. Um, but the only thing we found is actually suddenly we've got someone in a certain area on the community council who's really liking the idea of CSA. And so she's pushing forward that land and making it available. But actually, I, it seems to me like a lot of it's about just constantly trying to open up that conversation with different community councils and county councils just trying to get to know people and impress on them the value of of using land for community growing and I'm sure there's um uh yeah I mean there must be through social farms and gardens strategic work on like nationally on use of of public land I don't know um I mean yes I think to be honest the momentum within the sector trying to get more land for horticultural use it's starting to to gather momentum we're challenging more in terms of of policy um, and we certainly will be um, we're always happy to to challenge councils particularly uh, through the land advisory service so we have a, a bit of a resource for that but I think it's across across the board. I mean, I, I do work in um, community-led housing as well. And again, it's incredibly difficult for communities that know best exactly what their community needs, whether it's homes or growing spaces or green spaces, they know what, what it needs. But actually in terms of um, freeing up land for community use, it, it's incredibly difficult. Um, but yes, always keen to challenge 
So I think that's really all we can do. Um, well, being a future generations act as well, um, which is a very useful piece of legislation that we have in Wales. It's been around for quite a number of years now, um, but needs to be put into action a lot more. So that's a very good piece of policy to familiarise yourself with before you're having conversations with decision makers. So any other questions? Yeah. Oh, Tony, you've got a question <laughs> or a point. Really, I just wanted to maybe highlight a couple of things that uh, that Tom has has touched on. Um, and I think one, yeah, the perception, the business plans are for other people um, in order to persuade them to give you um, money and resources, I think is really common and is, is partly true. Um, but actually, I would really encourage you to think of business planning more for yourself. Um, and just as a business, you really need to understand what money's coming in, what requirements you have, what the risks are. That's really fundamental, uh, fundamental part of running your own business, regardless of whether you're asking the, 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 the bank for money. I see, and it's very, very gingery. So, yeah, I would read about that. But of course, you know, the, what the what's in the business plan depends very much on its purpose. So if you're writing a business plan for yourself, you don't have to put all the, all, all the stuff about the, the, the justifications and so forth, but you absolutely need to know how much money is coming in, what your costs are, whether you've got enough to cover it and what your risks are. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to um, pick up, Tom, you were saying that, um, that you know, you were essentially predicting your costs and, what, you know, and, and your income over a period of years. And that's really hard. Um, and you are, of course, making assumptions. And the quality of your business plan is basically dependent on the quality of your assumptions and the soundness of your assumptions. So I would say be really aware that that's the case. Look at your assumptions, really think about them, test them. Um, you know, it's in the assumptions is, is where your attitude to risk lies. So for instance, if you're quite a conservative person, then your assumptions need to reflect that. Um, but yeah, just think about your assumptions really, really, really carefully. And if you get it right, um, the chances are it'll be fine. And if you get it wrong, it could go catastrophic. <laughs> so. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Joanna? Uh, sorry for my unmuted moments earlier. Um, this may not be uh, uh, the right space to share, but um, I've got a kind of AGM coming up this Sunday to kind of share with the volunteers who some of the volunteers have um, an entitlement attitude developing where they kind of like put, kind of have a mentality where whatever I helped grow here and whatever plot I've been working on is needs to be rain fenced for them. I don't know where they got that idea from. It never started off like that. It, the, the, the space that we're working on is actually only a year and it's all based uh, just by, uh, so through the, there was no policy to start off with because it was just a wasteland where a um, few of the residents started to gorilla grow. And um, so now I've got a situation where some people, some of the local residents are asking me because I was the first person that did the gorilla growing and they say, what can we do to start to have a little bit of a plot? And um, I just wanted to ask if how does anyone, have they experienced something like this before and how do they manage it and what, how can I go, how do I conduct myself in at the AGM to really really emphasised the point strongly to say that this is not a privately owned land. What you grow here is on a voluntary basis and is for the community. Yes, it's a very difficult situation. And I guess as volunteers start to grow in themselves and their skills, they will start to develop that possibly personal ownership. But it is around bringing the sense of community back. And I actually might ask whether Poppy's got any thoughts at this point, because she runs a fantastic um, project based on an allotment in Cardiff. Um, and I mean, your focus 
Poppy and a lot of what you do is around sharing food and bringing it together to, to have shared meals. So I don't know, Joanna, I mean, Poppy, do you want to sort of mention any thoughts? Uh, thanks, Nicola. <laughs> yeah, hi, everyone. Um, maybe just one thing that sprung to mind when Julie was speaking was kind of having like a clear vision for the for the land that could be collectively agreed and then that helps everyone who works together on it if they don't follow that collectively agreed vision then they, you've got that to go back to so I don't know whether that might be helpful to kind of design together some kind of aims and objectives and vision for the for the area that then gives some yeah has more of a kind of um, something for people to understand otherwise people yeah I guess everyone makes their own interpretation of the space yeah thanks Poppy yeah I think um it, I think I'll probably just need affirmation from all of you guys experienced people because I'm really new to this um I don't even know what I've started now because it's you know I don't want it to be free for all and um, I have got the vision already and it's communicated already but I think some very what I call difficult personalities that I did not encounter did not foresee and I just feel like I may not have the confidence to sort that out but I'm gonna have to well this is the business isn't it and um, I might have to step out my comfort zone yeah I mean I think the AGM is a good opportunity to um sort of refocus on what your values and sort of shared objectives are as a as a group um, but I mean, we'll be mentioning it later on when it comes to values around actually it could sometimes it's useful to get an external facilitator in, in terms of agreeing values and vision. Um, so I, I won't do too much of a spoiler now, but the idea with an external person means that it's impartial and it's not just coming from you. So that sort of would take away some of that personal responsibility you feel for trying to, to sort this out. So could I just say, um... Yeah, I think actually, yeah, the same kind of agreeing with what Poppy said that actually I think you need some kind of agreed agenda and a kind of group of core group of directors to kind of decide. Because I know from our point of view, you know, I'm I'm so I'm seen as the person who kind of makes all the decisions by some people, which isn't actually the truth. You know, actually there's a group of directors behind what I do. Um, and that gives me real security. So I'm not you know, if I'm confronted by a really difficult decision, it's not just falling on me. So I don't have to face it on my own. Actually, you know, I can always tell anyone, look, I'm going to go back to the directors and ask them how we work this. So I think that I think it sounds to me like you need some kind of group of directors or core group so you don't have to feel on your own dealing with a big problem. Um, and just to bring Sarah in as well. Oh, thanks, Nick. Uh, quick question for Tom and Tony. When you've worked with farmers who you're, you, you know, getting to potentially release or rent land to CSAs, uh, is there any concerns expressed in, in terms of their single farm payment and who would claim that and how that might take them forward? Or, or has that not been a barrier in those discussions? Um, I only know of we haven't actually, none of the land that we've ever rented has been part of a single farm payment. But I do know that when Abby set up her CSA, Big Meadow, down in Clangenneth, he had payments and actually he had the added sort of complication that he was organic certified. So for her to come in, they, they basically, he had the option basically of taking that piece of land that he was leasing her out of his organic system and out of his... Um, I think he probably had single farm payment as well, because he's quite a big farm. Um, and in the end, they opted to keep it in and for her basically to go along with all the regulations and I think to pay something towards his his um, his scheme, towards his soil association scheme. But I don't, I haven't had any more experience than that, really. Thanks, Tom. Okay, just conscious of time, I think we'd like to definitely pick up questions um, later on. Again, um, we did start a little bit late, um, but we would like to have a comfort break as well before we get into the bulk of the sort of detail over the business planning. 
So in the joining instructions, um, did everybody receive a copy of a business plan template? If I can have a couple of thumbs up to say people got that okay. Yeah, fabulous. So um, this is purely a suggestion um, and it's kind of going to form, at, uh, form the basis of the session today that we're going to go through in a bit more detail. But there are lots and lots of different types of formats um, and it's brilliant that Tom's already shared um, the way that, that he's done it. You need to find a format that suits you. You definitely don't want to be tripped up by the business plan template. So there is the room to sort of tweak and amend it or find look and do some Google searches on business planning to find out one that really suits you. Um, but what we've done in terms of the template itself is rather than it just being a business plan template like you would get from somewhere like Business Wales is we've tried to make it much more specific to CSA. So hopefully you'll be able to definitely take something away from that. Um, We've also put in um, some additional page breaks in the format just to give you space to, to put your own notes and thoughts. And we deliberately sent it out as a Word document as well. So you've got that option to be able to edit straight onto that. Um, so, okay, so why a business plan? Um, I mean, Tony's already uh, put a bit of a convincing argument across uh, for a couple of points. So just to sort of reiterate, um, so it's a formal statement setting out your aims and objectives. Um, it assesses whether it's achievable and it takes, so you cover sort of thinking about the organization, where you are at the moment, what's happened in the past and where you're hoping to go. Um, and it also considers risks as well, which um, we've already had a discussion about land. If you have a lease on a land, it could, if there's break clauses in it, that is always going to be a risk, unfortunately. Um, but you need to also think about where you want to be. And again, with land as an example, is that something you want to try and put reserves away for to try and potentially purchase land in the future? So business planning makes you sit down and think. And for those of you that are in the dreaming stage at the moment, this is a brilliant time to, to have that space to think and reflect and really try and understand where you want to be in the future. Um, so it gives you a chance and time to think about the possibilities, but also do these stack up financially. And it also, you need to form a business case with some substance to it in terms of examining and demonstrating that there is actually demand for what you're planning to do because your financial figures aren't going to stack up if you don't get a certain number of members or customers. Um, and I mean some people feel find that action planning could be really helpful this can go alongside a business plan. Um, I had a group actually who had, they created a hundred page action plan and they wanted to convert that into a business plan. So just think about, I mean, you do want it to be a document, certainly a document that doesn't sit on the shelf. Um, you want something that's actually useful, um, but equally you want it to be ready on the shelf if that opportunity comes along that You've, there's um, a grant available and you want to apply for it or equally if something unexpected happens and you need to apply for some sort of emergency finance to have that on on the shelf ready to go is really really valuable so but it is something like I say that you can tailor for your own needs you can put in as many appendices, appendices as you like with marketing plans action plans additional financial or strategic plans the opportunities and possibilities are infinite, but in terms of a business plan, you want it to be relatively concise um, and follow a little bit of a standard format, which is where the template comes in. So Tony, did you have something you just wanted to mention there? You need to unmute. Uh, no, I probably think I so I've raised all my general points already, so I will not go over them again. Okay. I mean, well, just handing over to you and Sarah now, really, for um, a little bit of a before you start. Um, uh, thanks, Nick. I think um, what we wanted to stress here was um, there are a few things that's important for you to get kind of start thinking and doing before you get 
down to writing your business plan um, and these will help you get your head around what your startup costs will be what kind of finance um, and funding mix that you'll want in place beforehand um, and to help you plan how you're going to go about things um, and also to you know be realistic about you know um, your kind of first year um, uh, of production um, and how many boxes um, or membership um, shares you need to um, kind of get in the first year. Um, I think Tony was going to just mention briefly um, a few things here um, that we're going to go into more detail in the finance section, but I think that there's things that you need to do at the beginning before you start writing your business plan. Yeah, yeah I mean, again, I think it was just really um, sort of reiterating, looking at what you want to do. Uh, I'd say that again, because it's really important, really testing those assumptions. Um, it's a good time to actually have a look at what other people are doing. Uh, and I'm going to put, or somebody can put a link in the chat to the CSA UK Network um, website. It's in, so in the back of the business plan as well. Perfect, yeah. That's a really, really important resource for you. So you'll find a section in there that's uh, basically an A to Z of setting up um, a, a, a CSA. And that'll give you a, a lot of the information, all of the background information that you need. There's a lot of help in there with templates for, for instance, calculating the amount of land that you need. Um, there's some guidance on the sort of prices that you, you might expect. Um, so I think probably my main message is go there and use it because it's really, really important, useful information. Thanks, Tony. And yeah, I think at the beginning of the business plan, I think we do reference um, the UK CSA network quite a bit because they have got some great resources and we do work very closely with them. And as Nick mentioned before, when the process of translating some of their resources into Welsh, so they will be available bilingually um, for people. But um, yeah, uh, there's a cropping tool, a really useful cropping tool, which is, I've put the link right at the beginning. Um, Tony's gonna to go into more detail on that later, but that really does help you work out um, how much you need to be um, planting, how much land you need, pricing structure and things like that. And that is essential before you get down to writing your business plan. Great, um, does anybody have any questions at this stage? Um, we're gonna go into a break in a bit, I think, but um, yeah, we've got a, a good few minutes to, um, if anyone's got any points to raise or any more questions. Um, Hi, Alice. Yeah, I, if no one else is burning. So we are, um, our propagation tunnel is full. We're about to uh, begin our first year. Um, but my question is, we've got a business plan, actually, but I'm just wanting to make sure we've got all the other background stuff in place. So risk assessments, policy, that kind of stuff. Um, and we're, we're quite a small operation, but you know, we will have volunteers here but we haven't got any grant funding or anything like that. So there aren't any kind of other external um, requirements. But so I'm kind of wondering if there's like, um, yeah, guidance or good place to look for kind of templates to get us going for this first year. Cause I don't want to spend longer than I need to writing, you know, policies, risk assessments, but I want to just, you know, have a, a, ba a baseline. But... Are you talking about governance? Uh documents so i mean no. like working with volunteers or policies yeah yeah like written risk assessments for like having people come to the site and yeah so yeah maybe that is governance documents. yeah yeah um yeah i i'll um drop my email in here if you give me a uh, drop an email i can kind of send some links to you um and if you do need some more in-depth um support um you know we have got a mentor scheme in um wales so um we can refer you on to people like tony and tom as well if you did need 
gets some more support but I can definitely help um on the kind of governance side and give you some kind of templates as well that might be useful for you I was um, just going to say I'd happily share policies and whatnot that we've got because when we started up I know we just took all of ours from a, another similar organization and have adapted them so if there's anything I can send you some what I think would be useful if you wanted to have a look at those right yeah that's yeah. brilliant maybe Thanks, Sarah, Tom. forward me your contact yeah yeah definitely thanks Tom um, just a quick thank question you. for Alice you mentioned that you're based near Abergavenny setting up um, a CSA with the hope of trading this year um are you connected with um rob and zoe proctor at all because yeah, yeah. right okay that's yeah, great we are, we're working we've got a little uh, regional group going on supportive group here that so we're working with them yeah yeah brilliant <laughs> great okay are there any final questions before we have a five or ten minute break I mean, if anything springs to mind while we're on the break, um, feel free to talk to us informally or just pop it in the chat and we'll come back to it later on. So um, the time now is just after 20 past. If we can say if we're back at half past, if that's okay. In more detail and the finance section, um, Tony. Oh, well, finances aren't until right at the end, are they? Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring that up then. Yeah. Oh, right. In the finance section. I get it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. We were just, we just wanted to kind of stress the importance of doing these things um, before you sit down to write your business plan because it makes it much easier then for you. Um, I don't know. Is everybody back yet? I'm sharing my screen now, so I can't tell. Um, but yeah, just to let you know, um, I think when um, we could, uh, Tony's going to um, share his screen and show the cropping tool, but um, I have included a link in the beginning introduction so we can refer back to that. Um, jo said she's back. Uh, Ryan, are you there? If we can have any thumbs up from either Ryan or Marie or Poppy if they're back yet. That's great, I'm back, thanks. Okay. So yeah, you sh should all have had a copy of uh, this template in your email. Uh, joining an email um, and then I'm going to share the screen but as we go through if anybody wants me to if I'm not scrolling through Nick please let me know or Tony or Tom uh, right so you're going to leave it up yeah. now yeah so we're just on page two now of the business plan Okay, so we'll make a start back. So um, yeah, so Sarah's got her screen shared because we're now going to focus on the um, business plan template that we've provided um, and just going to go through it in a little bit more detail. So please feel free to sort of stop and ask questions as we go through section by section. Um, okay, so on to executive summary. So the idea of an executive summary is it's, it's much more than just an introduction. Um, it basically touches on everything that is important in your business plan. So you only want it to be one or possibly two pages maximum. Um, but quite often, it's literally the only thing that funders will read. So it's something that you really do need to write um, at the, the, the end once you've finished um, putting the entire business plan together and you really need to make sure that it, it touches on everything that is a sort of a headline figure. Um, in terms of the mission and uh, vision statement, um, 
these very much link to the values and principles. So Sarah, if you can just scroll down to the next section. So Tony's already spoken a little bit about the sort of values and principles um, that CSAs operate under. Um, the CSA network has a charter, which we put the link in for. Um, it's they've basically asked that anybody that joins the network, which if you are able to, I would sort of recommend in the sense that um, it shows strength and in the in the um, the sector um, and the movements. So by and it's kind of exactly the same as the concept of joining social farms and gardens as a member because when we're lobbying on behalf of the sector if we can say that we've got 600 members or whatever it really puts some weight behind the fact that we're only actually just one person to talk into to decision makers so yes that is the um there's a link to the charter um but it's a really good description of of what a, C a csa sort of operates under so it talks about people care earth care and fair share um, and then it talks about the working practices as well in terms of direct distribution shared risk which tony's already talked about and the connection to the farm um, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the connection to the farm later on in um, the sort of education and community outreach section so you, the values and principles, um, so this I guess is, is um, elaborating a little bit on what Joe was asking earlier. Um, it is something that's really important to try and thrash out quite early on because you're all, um, as a group of people that have come together with an idea, it's really important to make sure that your idea for the longer term vision is the same as each other's. And by putting that down into into words, it's really helpful because it does give you something to refer back to. Um, something that I come across uh, within the sector is something called mission drift. So this is something where you've sort of set up an organization with a purpose. You've got a set of values to sort of um, be able to compare opportunities to and to find out whether that fits within your your core operating principles whether they're worth worth taking and, and moving forward with um, but mission drift is where you you sort of move away from that you lose your core purpose um, and it's something that happens regularly in terms of people trying to gain funding because funders are always asking people for to create something new a new project something shiny that fits with their objectives so having those values and principles early on is is really important um it is um you need to think really around your uh, your business what you're planning to um what your purpose is you need to within a mission statement um so yes yeah, sorry breaking this down into a mission statement values and vision your mission statement is really your purpose. Um, it establishes uh, who you are and what you, you plan to do. Um, and you can have a number of goals and objectives under that that help define your mission and the types of um, things that you, the ways you're going to operate. Your values are your principles and beliefs. beliefs um, and these are very much embedded in your day-to-day -day activities um, and they need to be exhibited by the, the leaders, um, the managers, the people that are driving the project forward. Um, so you very much got to live by the, the values of the organization and, um, and sort of exhibit those for people um, involved in the organization um, as a volunteer or as a customer uh, to be able to, to see and understand. By having these values, it allows you to react quickly and decisively uh, with a sense of what is important. So as I was saying, as and when opportunities come to light, um, and it's an encapsulation of the different groups that have a relationship with your company. So you do need to think about the interests and the expectations of all the different stakeholders that you're going to be working with. Um, and then finally, the vision. So this helps to pull the mission and the values together. Uh, this is the vision of, of what, what you want to achieve in the future. Um, and you need to paint a broad picture 
um, of where, what type of organization you want to become. So my suggestion earlier, I mean, it, this is something that you can spend a lot of time on, um, but uh, having a, somebody external that isn't bringing or pushing their own beliefs forward, um, having, having that impartial person can be really helpful in this process. And um, it's something that can be sort of pulled together through a workshop. So I know that uh, Ryan, who's on the call from uh, Wild Horizons, they've, as a group, they've put a lot of work into getting the values and principles and mission of, of what they're trying to achieve sorted early on. On the other hand, I've worked with groups who absolutely have no idea. They own um, a number of community assets and potentially when the next opportunity comes to them they could end up with a fracture through their group in that some people want to go for the opportunity and some people disagree with the opportunity and don't think it's right for the organization but because they don't have those values and principles to to fall back on that's where the the disagreements can kind of start um and also just to bring um your attention ryan point uh pasted um, some good training that he had been on um, on group development and facilitation uh, navigate so he's put the link in the uh, the chat so um, I think that's me so over to Sarah for uh, to cover the introduction aims and smart objectives thanks Nick um, yeah well this ties in very much with um, what Nick's talking about with the values and principles so um, in your introduction um, you just want to be clear about um, who you are um, what you've already done like set the scene um, you know some of some some people will be further along than others um, some people will be starting from scratch um, you know, discuss here, you know, exactly where you're going to be located, how you, what you're going to produce, how you're going to produce, are you going to be organic, by, are you going to use biodynamic uh, principles, um, and who, who you've got as part of the team, what skills and experience you're bringing. Um, what... Sarah, sorry to interrupt, could you scroll down on the screen? Oh, yes, thank you. I need good pointers here thanks um yeah and um really have a good think about what your unique selling point will be um yeah and what your time scales are really um then with your aims and objectives um i think it's important to be really clear and concise here um you know um some i've seen some where people kind of ramble on for a few pages but you just need to really set you know what you're about um and your aims will generally be about what public good you're offering and um you know what are the additional benefits you're going to be um offering as well um because csas tend to have a charitable um aim and will also look at helping improve health and well-being through diet and exercise um, or physical activity, provide education and training, opportunities, volunteering, maybe work with schools. Um, you know, you, maybe your main aim will be to provide um, healthy local food and reduce a food miles. Um, and then set smart objectives so here you need to be really specific um, measurable set targets that you can then um, see where you're where you're at um, agree with stakeholders um, make sure that you have kind of engaged people and everybody's on board be realistic about um, the size and scale of your uh, business um, I think it's important to stress that you not to be too ambitious at the start. Um, I think quite often um, offering, um, you know, 20 to 30 boxes is a good starting point. Um, also look at how much land you've got and what's realistic to produce through this. And that 
I think that's where the cropping tool will be really useful. Um, and also, yeah, to be time bound. Um, so objectives need to be um, time bound. Um, have a look. Um, Tony or Tom, did you have anything to add here? Uh, no, I think you've covered it all very nicely. So, well, I will say I have just uh, highlighted what I what I put in the in the um, in the chat. Um, I had to, did a little um, bit of research, which basically highlights uh, some of the social benefits of CSA in more detail. If you are applying to a funding body and you need to meet uh, certain objectives and social objectives, this document will help you uh, pull out exactly what CSAs can deliver. Uh, and for those of you in Wales, um, it's also when you're in this, this part of justifying uh, what you're doing and how it links to government objectives, uh, the World Bank and Future Generations Act is a really a uh, useful piece of legislation um, and it is very easy to show how CSA projects deliver to nearly all of the goals in that, um, in that, uh, in that, in that piece of legislation. So uh, yeah, those of you in Wales, that's, yeah, that's, that's a nice big stick to beat the, uh, beat the government over the head with. Yeah, I'd say as well, we've got a document actually that um, um, a CSA in North Wales had just gone blank on Flintshire. So Flintshire basically put together a document a few years ago on how basically CSA answers all the issues around Future Generations Act. So I'd happily send that on to Ernan because we've often used that and just sent the document straight to funders. Um, I was just thinking about the size as well of um, starting point of a CSA because I think that really depends on the skills of the grower setting up. I sort of think that actually it'd be quite viable for a new CSA to start straight off with like 150 members if they had a really good grower um and I, you know it just means we're chatting to that one in hereford actually at the moment and supporting them in getting up and going and i think they're going to start with 50 to 100 members and abby who trained with us down here she started with 70 members um and i think it's almost actually if you've got the space and you know what you're going to do whether you start with 20 or 70 members it's almost like actually there's not it's you're doing the same thing if you've got the labor to deal with it you might be better off starting with more because it means you have more income coming in more quickly right yeah that'll be a really useful document to share actually tom um if you can send that on to us do you think it's worth setting up a google drive and just sticking because we've got lots of examples of business plans as well that we've pulled together so we could just have a, a CSA business um, a Google Drive and just stick all the documents on there and share the link, say clogging up people's emails. Yeah, definitely. It's a good idea. Um, so Sarah, could you, for moving on to the next section, do you mind not share or taking your screen share off for a little bit so I can yeah. see people because there's quite a, a bit to cover in this section um, which isn't necessarily written down. Oh, uh, Marie, have you got a question? Um, or is that a, a support for the Google Drive? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So um, moving on to the, the next section, so page six, um, looking at demand. So this was what I was talking about in terms of making sure your business plan is backed up. So you've come up, you've got this vision of what you want to achieve, um, but you need to be sure that the customers are out there and that will help inform your financial planning. So um, the questions are sort of what is the project need? Uh, can you evidence um, that to demonstrate the need? Um, what do you know about other uh, CSAs? And also who are your stakeholders? So that's people with an interest in what you're doing. Um, so this really is the feasibility uh, section of your business plan. Um, and it may well come from a previous feasibility study if you've conducted one. So this is a bit of market research. And like we said, demonstrating the need, both looking nationally. Um, so potentially at um, social, economic and environmental factors 
that would demonstrate a need. So with, with climate change, wanting local food, short supply chains um, and reducing food miles, there are many um, environmental um, and social needs as well. And then you need to demonstrate the need on a local basis. So this is going to be more linked to um, a local survey, but you do need to be very careful about what you're asking. So is your survey specifically for people who are looking at buying from you? Or is this for people who potentially might be volunteering? Or do you want to ask them if they're interested in volunteering? So this is really your opportunity. Um, it's also important to understand what the public actually understand a CSA is, because that in itself potentially is a barrier to people engaging with you. Um, it's that that need to raise awareness. Um, and I wanted to pick up a, a quote from Kai Tan's business plan, which in, in the demand section, which was um, that CSAs across Wales are consistently better value than buying from the supermarket. Now, I think the concept of value is something that is what you need to be uh, sort of breaking down in your survey. So what is important to people? Is it that food is organic? Is it that it's fresh? Is it that it's not traveled so far and that's reduced the food miles? But equally, there's so many additionals when it comes to CSAs because you're looking at potentially building the sense of local community. You're looking at providing local jobs and you're also giving those opportunities for uh, volunteering opportunities, which again can help stimulate the economy by helping people back to work from regaining confidence and skills. So these are all things that you've got that opportunity to put in your initial survey and then potentially bring back into this section. You've also got to think about who is actually driving the want for this CSA. So is it farmer driven? Is it the, the landowner who really wants to provide it? Or is it community driven? Um, and from the sort of more consumer point of view that particularly for some rural communities in Wales, there aren't those necessarily those opportunities to, to buy local. And even though food might be grown around them, quite often it's not actually available locally as, as a wholesale or direct farmer, um, farmer led sales. So there's opportunities for farmer cooperatives and there's also opportunities for farmer um, consumer cooperatives as well. So all of that really needs to come into your demand and that will hopefully give you an insight as to what, what type of model you want to be creating for your, your CSAs. So in terms of the management section, so now we're on to page seven, um, this is very much the higher level side of things um, in your business plan. And it starts off with legal structure, which we could literally run a whole session on in itself. And hopefully um, we're going to be providing a governance um, and legal structure seminar at some point specifically around CSAs. Um, so watch this space, but there are, um, I think there have been webinars that have been run and there's various YouTube videos as well, but it's something that's very personal and that you need to be putting a lot of time and research into because what you don't want to do is register too quickly in the wrong type of legal structure and then be uh, sort of plagued forever more to have to file your, your um, information, your accounts and so on in that format if it's really not the right thing to do. So important things to consider when you're choosing your legal structure. Um, so who are your stakeholders? Um, who ultimately will be in control of the business, the decisions made around the business? Um, so will it be members? Will it be the landowner or the farmers? Also, what um, in, in terms of voting rights, um, if consumers are to share the, the risks of the farming, should they have an opportunity to be able to understand and influence the way that their foods um, produce? So this is in terms of voting rights. So again, this all needs to be considered in your legal structure. Um, will your structure protect the enterprise against disruptive in individuals who wish to take control? So we've already spoken a little bit about that today. Um, again, 
mapping these things out in a structure, a memorandum and articles is going to help support you. Does the community group um, own the land? So again, thinking about this relationship between the landowner and the group in terms of whether you're, you're planning to buy the land long term or, or rent or lease initially. Um, how will your CSA get some um, the startup and working capital? Again, if you get the wrong legal structure, there's every chance you might you might be excluded from some of the grants that you want to be applying for. So just just think very carefully. Um, and also, will your structure accommodate change in the future? So what happens if your main founders want to leave? Uh, what if you want to double the number of employees or buy more land? Um, and finally, what would happen if the scheme was to decide to wind up? What would happen with the assets? So in terms of the legal structure, there is uh, specialist advice available out there. Um, I know that the Wales Cooperative Centre are um, under Social Business Wales are running their New Start programme. So you can access business consultants who are actually able to give you advice. Um, so what we're able to do under this program is mentoring. So mentoring is meant to be different than advice in that you're sharing from experience from something that you've done yourself, whereas consultants are able to actually help you make decisions um, and help point you in directions of they believe is, is the right thing for you. So that's worth looking at and I'll, I'll try and pop the, the website in the chat later on. You can run initially potentially without a legal structure, but you wouldn't be able to employ any staff or, um, and have any company assets at that point. So assume, uh, as soon as you're looking at the point of either taking loan finance or applying for grants, you will need a legal structure. So you need to think about whether you're going to be profit or non-profit. And I know that might sound a bit bizarre, but there some, in theory, CSAs could be profit making. Um, and it obviously depends what you want to do with that profit. Um, you, most uh, CSAs are set up as social enterprises. So with the social, charitable and community-based missions and visions uh, and objectives. Uh, so every social business needs to make a profit. And even though that is classed as a dirty word sometimes, it's the difference is that it becomes it's reinvested uh, for community benefit. And in terms of typical structures, um, quite often you get community interest companies as um, a model that's very widely used. Um, when you're registering, you need to uh, create a statement of community interest um, to, as part of your registration. So again, doing some business planning up front and really refining those, those visions and, and values is really important. Um, another structure that's used commonly are cooperatives um, and this is a membered, member owned business where uh, members are either employees, customers or suppliers or community members, people with, with an interest and they get to help make decisions as to where the profits are reinvested. So there are other models including Community Benefit Society which is, start, is sort of a more um, a newer model, but is very widely used for share issuing shares. Um, and I had a quick chat to, to Tony earlier um, and asked, because I know some older social enterprises and charity, well, they're set up as charities with a company limited by guarantee running alongside, but based on the paperwork burden of having to file two sets of accounts um, to once the charity's commission and one to the um, company's house, it's going to create a, a lot of extra work for yourself so Tony do you have anything else to add on just sorry on the legal structure side of things uh no I think you have have covered it and yeah I think actually the, the, the critical thing is that you get the right structure for the approach that you want to take to fundraising whether that's applying for grants or, or membership offers that's that, that's really what's central um, and I think also the setting out the the management um, the structure Tom may have something to contribute and comment on on this um, 
but certainly you have to be very clear about what kind of decisions uh, are being made by, by whom. Uh, I think uh, I know a number of growers who've got into a situation where they're having to run decisions like buying seed growing media and essential inputs past uh, past committees and that's really problematic because you basically need to be able to buy what you need to get what you get what you need to do and get everything in the ground at the right time for it to work so just be uh, I think it doesn't necessarily need to be bound up in the legal structure but there needs to be a very clear understanding about who can take what decisions when and at what point um, purchasing decisions have to go back to the board um, yeah Tom, have you had to grapple with this? Yeah, it, it kind of slowly evolved. I think originally when we set up, um, we very clearly have set up as like a grower-led CSA. So that means that myself and Lizzie make all the day-to-day -day decisions. And I, I personally feel like it's the best way to go because it just means things happen quickly and efficiently. But at the same time, as we've got bigger, and our finances have got more complicated. There's definitely, we, we rely a lot more on our finance person, Ruth, now. And I think quite often me and Lizzie will double check with her before we'll spend. And if she wants to check with other directors, she'll do that as well. So I think, yeah, I think as early days, it's probably fairly straightforward, but I think as you grow and finances become more of an issue, it's really good to have a person who's really got their head around the finances, who everyone can double check with, get a, get a second opinion from them. That's great. I think so, uh, I'll just say as well, Tom did mention earlier when he was going through his business plan um, that you do you have picked um, people with specific expertise as well. And um, it is good to have a look at kind of the skills that you might need um, and having people that understand funding or finances, um, obviously growing, but also other activities that you might want to undertake like education or volunteers um, as well is really helpful. So, Sarah, did you want to share the plan again and just go over to page seven so this was the management page because yeah I pretty much I mainly focused on covering the legal structure then um, and there was just picking up points that all three of you have mentioned in terms of um, the higher level decisions so this is deciding on your core group your um, directors and committee um, who are they how many people do you want sort of as a, a maximum or an ideal number in terms of decision making who will run your CSA who's involved um, so this is your opportunity to mention people um, the sort of founder members um, or people that you'd like, like to be working with in the future um, staff or volunteers are they paid or unpaid um, I think there's an opportunity for volunteers potentially to have some type of time banking potentially discounts I don't know um, how that works in 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 reality but there um, is there is there going to be any sort of expenses or, or refreshments covered um, and then on the day-to-day -day delivery so this is how quickly can you make a decision as a grower um, do you need to go back up to the committee um, and if so how many people need to be present to make those decisions um, but keeping it simple um, but um, can can uh, sort of save a lot of time later on. So, and then on the ground delivery, what will this look like? So in the field, in terms of procedures, uh, the weekly connection hub, recruitment and reporting, what type of reports do need to be provided to the committee? Do you plan to take on trainees? Um, how will you, will you coordinate volunteers? And finally, um, thinking about insurance, health and safety and risk assessments. So over to you, Sarah. Could I just, could I just mention one thing, um, thinking about that, because I think it's kind of critical. Um, I found that critical for us anyway, with choosing our directors. I think, you know, like who your directors are can be a real make or break of how well the CSA functions. Probably the same with any group, but I'm just thinking about the CSA. And I think um, I think it's really important to choose people who you kind of know and you kind of know how they operate 
and you're comfortable with discussing because you know there's a lot to discuss and I think it, I, I've just been in in situations in groups that I've other groups I've been involved in where actually you get a few tricky people in that group and it can really disrupt the operation and really disrupt how the whole thing just can't move forward smoothly so I think I think it's very worth like choosing people who you're comfortable with and who you think have got something really valuable to bring to the CSA. I think don't choose people because you think they would like to be part of it. I think you really have to choose people who are going to be really good for the overall CSA. Great, thanks Tom. Yeah, and you know, going, I think it's important, especially at the start, to have those trusted people involved and um, part of your board. But um, as you grow, um, I've noticed that with um, other groups, not just um, CSAs, I, I work with other kind of community groups, um, some of them might have specific skills gaps and um, then they've gone and sought out um, specific people to help um, with those kind of things. Um, and yeah, so it, it's good to kind of, yeah, look who you've got about you that have the certain skills that you need and who who you feel um can kind of add value to what you're doing and are trusted um moving on to um just marketing and sales now um i'm just going to focus in on um this box here um basically um to talk about membership um, offer um, to begin with. And there's no real hard or fast rules here. There's lots of different variations, but generally um, CSAs offer a monthly subscription. And um, this is normally paid a month ahead. Um, it's important to be mindful of uh, membership turnover as well. Um, and as Tom showed before, um, you know, he has a waiting list um, of mem new members to arrive. So um, it's, you know, good to have that kind of month ahead um, because when people do leave, at least you've got time to fill the kind of slot. Um, there's an example here of the type of kind of boxes and membership offers that um, you can offer. Um, another example I've taken from Canal Side CSA in Warwickshire, um, they not only offer a monthly subscription um, for a veg box, um, but they also offer an annual subscription as a, a social member, and that can help support wider CSA activities. Um, and then also an investor member, which um, contributes to a com community share offer so they can help buy their land. Um, yeah, so there's different types of uh, subscriptions. Um, Tom, what do you do over in Kaitan? We've got a fairly straightforward subscription of just a small share or large share. Um, but yeah, we've also been discussing recently doing something more like canal side and opening up the options. So we've got, you know, different tier, different levels people could invest in. So if people wanted to invest in the schools program or in supporting someone else to have a box who couldn't afford it. So, yeah, but we it's pretty basic at the moment. Yeah, great. And then, yeah, um, I think I'm going to bring it up in a bit, but um, it's good that you've mentioned kind of um, supporting low income families. Um, and it's something that I found a few people have asked recently is how they can um, offer free or um, subsidized boxes to um, people in the community um, who might be struggling. And um, there's some information on the UK CSA network about this. Um, which I think I've, I've got a link later on, um, but it's also something you can offer in your membership for people to um, do, um, donate or um, pay a bit extra towards um, a kind of subsidised boxes for people. Um, just something else to think about. Um, so 
operations. Um, I think this is where you need to really think about where you're located. Are you close to um, an urban population or, um, you know, are you close to your membership? Because um, this will affect how um, you distribute. Are you, um, do you have local pickup? Um, points or are people coming to the farm to pick up themselves or do you have a delivery service? Um, how will this be coordinated? Um, how much land do you have or how much land are you going are you, do you need? Do you need to look for more land? Is there anything locally? Um, what facilities do you need? Do you need structures? Do you need um, packing sheds, food storage? What do you have already? Um, what equipment do you have or things that you need? Um, pricing strategy again. Um, and yeah, looking at things like your relationship with organisations locally and businesses. Um, and also, um, I think it'd be good for Tony or Tom to talk about um, how um, how you'll address the hunger gap, um, because obviously there's going to be points in the season and in the year where you won't be growing much at all, and especially at the beginning. Um, are you going to buy things in um, or have you thought of things like salads that you could grow um, in polytunnels um, that you can offer at these times? Um, Tom, what do you do over in Kaitan? So, yeah, we we buy in. Um, we just figured it's much easier just to keep the scheme going all year rather than ask members to sort of sign in and out, which I know some CSAs do. Um, so we basically aim for growing everything we possibly can and obviously it varies from from year to year um, and again I think some CSAs just say you know people pay whatever whether there's produce or not but we feel like actually we've got the income from people um, we can afford to buy produce in and it's quite good also to support um, wholesale growers across Wales if we can buy potatoes or carrots from Romeo or whatever or whoever it is down in West Wales then that's an addition to the benefits of the CSA so yeah we we buy in and it's it's not a huge amount um but I would say actually yeah actually considering the cash flow that's one thing we found over the years that there's a sudden drop basically we go from being part-time as growers to full-time in April and actually, that's also the time of year when we're buying produce in. Um, so suddenly there's a big strain on resources between April and July, April and June, July. Um, but yeah, I think I think it works well to to supplement and buy produce in. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, and I know that um, there are obviously it's great if you can buy things in locally. Um, I know there's a CSA app here in North Wales um, and they kind of partner with an organic farm in Spain. Um, so with, there's, there's always um, a nice selection of kind of organically grown kind of tomatoes and salads and things like that. And it helps them at um, kind of hand gap stages. Um, there's also added value products as well other things that you can sell um or uh, services that you can provide um i think these are important to be additional and shouldn't um be your main income though um right where are we at now i've lost so so while you do that chris add yeah. uh, just a, a comment there I mean, one of the ways to deal with the hungry gap is is not to deal with it. Um, when you start up your CSA, say, you know, we are providing our vegetable shares from um, whatever it is, May through to through, through through to November, and not try and do that. From a operational point of view, that's um, quite a useful thing to do, and certainly when you're starting up. Um, I think it's much easier from a technical point of view. The risk is that if you do 
stop your box scheme, then the question is whether you get your guys back at the beginning of the next season. So that is a risk. Um, but I know a number of CSAs have successfully dealt with it by not dealing with it, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And I think it's good as well um, to, you know, this is where engagement and um, connecting with your community and membership comes in the place. I remember in the early stages of a couple of the main um, CSAs setting up um, here, um, people were complaining about, you know, not having much of a selection in their boxes or things kind of, you know, winding down at certain points. And I think, you you know, people don't understand the growing season sometimes. And it's really important that you kind of communicate this um, through to people. And also um, what a Ted and Teg, a lovely CSA up in North Wales do as well, is on their Facebook page, um, they give, uh, weekly recipe ideas um, which helps people think about you know um, how to use their veg and things that they might not be used to using or when you know the selection is kind of um, low um, so yeah just keeping people informed and engaged and educating people as well because we have lost that seasonality um, go, you know, being able to access everything in supermarkets. Um, all right, we'll go on. So, yeah, um, obviously it's good to define your membership offer here and who your customers are, um, how, you know, how many you're going to hit, um, start off with, how, how are you going, are you going to also offer um kind of drop in can people come and pick up a, um additional uh, boxes um it's good to scope out what your competition is are there csas uh, other csas or other box schemes locally um can you add value um to those and um you know um what are they already selling um, do they have a waiting list? Um, what's your su local supply chain like? Um, are there businesses that you could sell to or looking to buy local? Um, and um, yeah, um, are you going to di sell direct um, online or yeah, through membership? Um, it's also important to kind of you know, set out what your strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats are. Um, um, do that here. Um, Tom, say, um, so, sometimes people are not always clear um, about what the difference between um, a weakness and a threat is. And it's actually quite an important distinction. So um, the way it works is that strengths and weaknesses are internal to your business. So basically, that's the stuff that you've got control over. Um, and the opportunities and the threats tend to be external things. So uh, an example of a, of a weakness might be not enough skills within your own business. Um, that is within your gift um, to, to manage and improve. A threat might be that the planning system uh, is impossible to negotiate. That's not something that's under your control. It's something you will have to consider and to manage. Um, but uh, that 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 distinction's really important in terms of, uh, of, of 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 how you either capitalize or address your strengths and weaknesses uh, and opportunities and threats. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. And also, um, these can be interchangeable as well. So something that is a strength could potentially be a weakness as well. And, you know, look at these things at different sides of the same coin, I suppose, um, just to build the resilience. Um, you need to think of having a marketing plan in place, and this could be a separate plan um to your business plan um and looking at what your products are um what your pricing strategy is um 
where you're based and how you're going to promote this. Um, and, you know, are you going to use social media? That seems to be really popular with CSAs um, at the moment. Um, you know, Tom, that you guys have got some brilliant videos up on YouTube, um, which is a great way of showing people what you're doing. Um, you, you know, you might want to subscribe um, to, uh, you know, advertise in um, magazines or kind of local newspapers. Um, yeah, think about how you're going to advertise and promote what you're doing. Um, and that, I think, leads on into how you're going to uh, engage the community uh, more widely, really. And um, that's a good way of um, kind of getting uh, your name out there as well. And Tom, you guys have done quite a bit on community engagement and outreach, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Should I was just thinking actually about... Um... Yeah, that was a key thing for us when we started up marketing wise. And I think it's really good is to like, we kind of piggybacked, there was an existing organization called Gower Power. And they had like a whole database of people who, who were interested in local food, local power. Um, so if there's any local environmental organization with like a big, you know, list of people involved in it already, we basically went to them as our first port of call. Um, and pretty much made up our, our membership from their mailing list, um, which is, yeah, which is pretty handy, really. Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen as, at Social Farms Gardens, we've seen a huge um, increase in um, interest and demand over this last year um, with everything that's happened. Um, and, you know, I think it is good to just see what kind of, yeah, community um, groups out there that you can kind of advertise. And, you know, I don't think it's that difficult to find interested people really at the moment. I think people are starting to see the importance and the value of buying local healthy produce and to buy locally. Um, you know, we've got um, in um, a really amazing like fish, local fishmongers that's just appeared over um, uh, this last year locally and you know things are moving away from the high street again back into the community I think. Um, I can see chat flashing so I don't know if there's any questions at this stage. I'll stop sharing my screen for a bit. Has anyone got any questions? No? Is Tra Tracy? No? Okay. <laughs> um okay um yeah so we'll can move on to um community engagement um tom do you want to talk about the outreach work that you do yeah sure um actually i've got a little slide there on it um so i'll just screen share i can get back to it So there was a brief one. Actually, I'd, I'd written something briefly on marketing as well, um, which actually I, I won't go into because we kind of passed through that and I was just going to refer back to the business plan. But I think that's probably all been covered anyway. Um, but community engagement and outreach, I think that tied in for us with, with engaging members and sort of marketing. It's almost like the whole thing is so tied up together. So like I said, I think... We joined forces with Gower Power, um, but that could be, I'm pretty sure when Coca started up in West Wales as well, they joined, it came out of like a local environmental group based in St. David's. And it was that group that recognized the need to support local food. Um, and it was exactly the same with us. Gower Power had said, right, we want to promote local energy, local food, um, and this is the way we want to do it. And then they approached me to say, what do you think? Do you want to come and do something here? So that's the way we sort of came about. Um, and then our schools work, I definitely say like engaging with schools is a really good way to the heart of the community. Once you've got like schools and families involved, 
it generates a lot of interest in what you're doing um and key people in the community so in our case i'd say it was you know it was like when we came it was ant flanagan from gower power who because he'd already set up this network and he basically knew all the key people locally um plus i'd sort of grown up here so even though i hadn't been around for a long time i came in knowing having a lot of contacts um and i think just really building on existing contacts people who know who you know will be influential and and and, and sort of talk well about the project idea and then community councils so yeah if you can get someone on a community council talking um any i think any amount of sort of public platform you can do we had an interesting situation where uh, just this week where we're discussing with a housing um i keep thinking a housing co-op but they're not a housing co-op they're a housing association in swansea east and we've been discussing the possibility with them about in their next big development incorporating a csa into it and then last week and it hadn't really got anywhere and actually the the lady who from the housing association we've been discussing it with was getting a bit frustrated and then last week i did a presentation for university and it happened that one of the key people involved in the housing association was at that meeting and then they came back to the core group to say oh why don't we set up a csa <laughs> and this poor lady who'd been banging on about it all year suddenly because it came from someone else in the group it was like taken really seriously so i think the more people who you can just get that idea of csa into their head the better um so yeah just engaging on any level um, running launch events so we ran a launch event we invited Gerald to come and talk about what coca was and I think he just charmed everyone and just sort of you know he just it was just such a lovely evening and he showed lots of pictures and he spoke about how what what goodness it had brought to him and his farm and the family um, so that was really valuable and then I've done the same thing for when Abby set up her CSA, I went to the community she was setting it up in and spoke about working with Abby and what our CSA brings to our community. So I think that's really valuable. Um, media coverage, um, just anywhere through social media, newspapers, anything at all, you can get any kind of coverage, that's great. And crowdfunding, we did some crowdfunding at the outset and I know Big Meadow also did that um and i think just the whole process often crowdfunding is a big pain it's a lot of work for sometimes not a huge amount of money if you look at the amount of work you put in but i think the whole process of crowdfunding and making such a big um making such a big uh, issue in the media about what you're raising the money for that's as valuable as the money you get from it often that brings a lot of members interest in and the last thing I'd say is just asking people for help right from the outset. I think people want to help if they if they recognize it's a good idea and people have got their hearts like they realize this organization's got its heart in the right place. It's really trying to do something good. I think people really want to be part of the solution and they just want to get involved and help. Um, I think sometimes with Kaitan, we've got to the point where actually because we've been so successful in certain elements of what we do that the community side of us of our organization backs off and doesn't help i think sometimes it's quite good to be a bit vulnerable as an organization and say we need help so yeah i'd say just feel at ease to ask people for support and that yeah that's it thanks thanks tom great um We've had a request um, as to whether Tom would be happy to share some of his presentations or the slides from today. I think it's really inspiring, certainly uh, for people when there's only one representative from a, a potential group here today, just to, to go back and, and share pictures of people actually doing things rather than just uh, being, thinking about things. So I have um, created a um, Google Drive or a section on the Google Drive, which I've just shared in the uh, chat. 
and we'll put this out again with the link to the recording for the session as well. So I think my request to um, all of the sort of people coordinating today is if we can upload any resources to there, then it just saves having to share things individually. So hopefully if somebody wants to test that as well, uh, just to double check that the sharing preferences are fine. I think they are. So um, the last part of today's session, um, I mean, we're due to finish at four o'clock um, and it would be nice to have a little bit more time for some questions. We've got um, a little bit of financial stuff to cover. Tony wants to go over the cropping tool um, and I think then that will sort of draw us to a close on the, the template. Um, shall we have literally two minutes now if people want to grab a glass of water or put the cat out or something and, um, and then re-adjourn in literally two minutes? We've covered those. Um, I, I won't share my, my screen unless anybody wants to no, at this stage. I'll just keep it. No, I think um, we might want to share the, the template for the finances in a moment. Okay, are people back? Could we have any thumbs up? Thank you. Brilliant. Oh, Marie's commented. That's fabulous. Right. So just the, the final push now just to get through this because it is a difficult, well, a slightly dry subject. It's much more exciting when you, you start to, to write your own and research. Um, but uh, hopefully this will put everyone feeling positive and knowing what they're trying to achieve in terms of starting to map things out. So we're up, we're on to page 11. Uh, we've just covered marketing and uh, community engagement and outreach. Both of those, I would say, are quite extensive sections and probably could well warrant um, separate appendices uh, at the back of your um, your your uh, business plan, particularly if you want to do some action planning or have a separate marketing strategy. So again, just don't feel bound by any particular template, just use it as, as you feel fit. So on to measuring success. Um, I don't have a huge amount to say in this section. Um, it's mainly, we just, it's I guess, making sure that what you're writing in your business plan is measurable. So this is going back to what Sarah was saying earlier around smart objectives. Um, so what does success look like and how will you measure it? Um, examples of how this can be done both quantitatively and qualitative, qualitatively. Anyway, um, you want to set some targets as well. So again, this is uh, thinking about where you want to be in a year's time, in five years time, potentially even in 10 years time for the number of members, the amount of land you're growing on and um, ideas of yeah, um, how big your enterprise is going to be, uh, members of staff, numbers of volunteers, and also in terms of what you want to be achieving in terms of the community engagement and outreach. Um, I, I think that's it from me on measuring success. Tony and Tom, have you got anything to add in terms of how it shapes up in reality? Uh, not not particularly. Uh, I think the um, I, I think just um, be realistic when you set your targets, particularly when you're starting up. Um, uh, ambitious but achievable is probably the, uh, <laughs> the the place that you need to be. Um, and I think it's it's quite important that you, it's one of those things that you keep going back and reviewing in the light of experience or changing circumstances. Uh, so don't look at it as a um, uh, a, uh, a sort of binding um, thing. Um, certainly, I don't tend to put my targets too far into the into the future. Uh, I think setting out my 
the 10 year targets now, I think is probably fairly unrealistic. We're in 2021 now, you think back to 2011, uh, and an awful lot has happened um, <laughs> within those 10 years. So I think it keep it relatively short, short term, keep it realistic, and yeah, just set your targets such that you are likely to achieve them. That would be my my advice. Tom, any thoughts? Yeah, no, yeah. That, that sounds good. I think um, the only thing I'd add is just um, making the most of like mentoring, you know, really, there is more and more CSAs out there who are who have got experience. So I'd say if you're not sure of any particular aspect of your planning, yeah, just go and speak to as many people as you can and ask advice. Um, and yeah, I'd agree with Tony that things do change. So as much as you can plan, I think it's also a matter of once you've got your core group together, regularly meeting and kind of looking at you know whether things are going to plan and how you're going to adapt in the light of how things are changing so yeah i think that's it yeah yes, and um if you're not based in wales i think the uk csa network can um provide a bit of mentoring as well can't they yeah and the land workers alliance as and well. land workers alliance yeah so um yeah definitely check in with them if you're not based in wales um great well uh, um Going on to the financial aspects, I think there's a lot of important things to cover in this bit. So I'll be really quick with my section. I was just going to quickly um, mention funding. Um, you will see at the right of the back um, of the business plan, um, there's some useful resources um, where we've listed a lot of links to um, some of the things we've mentioned already, but there is a list of the type of funding and places to start looking as well. And I think it's important to think of think of your startup costs and also how you're going to um, address those and have a you know what will your funding mix look like. And um, this could be uh, depending on your legal structure uh, structure and the income that you will generate. Um, you know, it can be a mix of um, grants, uh, low interest loans, uh, crowdfunding, which um, Tom's mentioned, and I think it is a really good engagement tool, but be realistic about crowdfunding. Um, and, you know, it might be a really good um, tool to use to um, get some funding towards a specific um, element of the CSA or a project or um, some equipment. Um, always good to have someone that's really good with social media to really push that as well. Um, and there's not much really about at the moment with kind of uh, covering salaries, but one really good thing, which I think is um, available UK-wide, is the Kickstarter kickstarter scheme um which can help pay towards apprentices and i don't know tom if you want to mention land workers alliance um and the kickstarter scheme yeah so um yeah the land workers alliance have been operating for the first time this year um they're kind of what you call like a gateway organization to secure funding from the hmrc to host trainees on different farms across the UK. But the, the system's actually changed so that now anyone can apply. So actually, you know, as Kaitan now or as whatever your organisation is, you can just apply as an individual. And that, that might be, well, it's kind of up to you. You could look into the options. It might be simpler or you might prefer just to have a group like the Land Workers Alliance administer it for you. But it basically means that you can get a trainee for 25 hours a week for six months of the year for six yeah and um if you want them to work more hours you can pay them more but the government will pay 25 hours i think it's a scheme that currently is only operating until december and then it'll be reviewed but hopefully they'll carry it on through next year thanks tom I'm sure because i'm conscious of time um go on to um Tony, Tony, you're going to talk about the show as the cropping tool and talk through risk assessments and sensitivity analysis. Yeah, that's right. So this is this is basically all about financial planning. Um, and 
give me a moment while I get the right. That's there we are. Um, okay, can everybody see that? Yeah. That's yeah. So it's um, I I think as you as you get experience and as you grow and develop, you will get quite a clear idea of what your costs are, what you can charge, um, you know, what your losses are in terms of, um, uh, of, of waste and, and all of those sorts of things. So that's something that you will develop as you go. But the challenge for, I think, a lot of people on this call who are starting up is just, is, is starting from scratch. You don't have any historical data to work on. And this is where this little uh, spreadsheet that the Soul Association has produced is, is really, really useful. Um, it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, so you put in there the number of, of shares. I think this has actually started out as a box scheme, but it works pretty well for CSAs as well. Um, so, you know, there's, there's 50 in there, but if you wanted to change it to, um, to 100, for instance, that um, it basically just helps you set out um, uh, the your um, your your produce requirements. So, for instance, uh, if you're looking to supply onions year round, um, a kilo in each box, um, that tells you uh, how many. <coughs> how many kilos you need over the year. Um, it gives you some indicative value of, uh, uh, some, in, some indication of the value uh, of that product on the market. In fact, with CSAs, you've got a slightly different structure because you're charging uh, whatever it is, £12.50 for a box. But the crucially important thing is it helps you um, look at the, about the, the area of land that you're going to need that, that, that you're going to need for that um, and that's a really good starting point i'll go back to what i said right at the beginning um, about assumptions um, and uh, you know you will need to review that as you go along and change your assumptions about yield and change your assumptions uh, about um, how much you will lose to pests and disease and all the rest of it but just to get you started uh, i think this is a really really important tool and I do quite a lot of uh, business planning and consultancy, and this is this is what I use as my starting point for a lot of the businesses that that, that I support. Um, it is really easy to use and really quite self-explanatory, um, but as I say, it is limited in that there's just standard data in there, and you will need to adjust that uh, that as you go through. Um, so I was just going to introduce that to you quickly, but are there any questions on that? Um, and I, I will put this into the Google Drive so people can access it. And I've lost my chat, so I can't see. <laughs> yeah, there's, um, I have also put it in the chat, uh, but also just to point out, it, there's a link on the first page of the business plan template as well, and it's available on the UK CSA network. Um, yeah, there's no questions in the chat. Joanna was just saying it looks like a useful um, tool. But yeah, has anybody got any questions on that? Please you know, feel free to ask. It doesn't cover any of the polytunnel crops, does it? Or is that somewhere I can't see? But, um, but no, so it's basically field. Um, okay. it's, it's, it's mostly based on field crops. Um, which brings me on to my next point, um, is that there's very limited range of crops there. Um, and quite often CSAs will be producing more than that. And uh, as Tom has alluded to, probably having polytunnel protected crops is pretty much essential if you want to provide a wide range of veg uh, over, over season. So there are other resources um, which give you nice standard figures for um, glasshouse crops so a little bit more complicated a little bit more involved um, which is why I chose not to go to them in detail today but I will put them into the Google Drive so you can access them um, uh, but as I say I 
what, what this also helps you do is to break down the process. So you decide what's going in the box, you decide how many weeks of the year um, that you're going to supply them for, you come up with the total, um, and through yield data that translates into, in, into, a, in, into an area. Um, what they've done here is they've divided it into, in, into rotational blocks, so that gives you some, uh, some idea and a basis on which to actually plan your crop rotations um, on the field. Um, and yeah, I would really recommend you use that as a starting point. I'm just wondering, because um, I know Gary and the Social Farms and Guns have got funding to develop a kind of crop planning tool. And I wonder actually whether it'd be useful just to actually develop this one further to just have all the polytunnel crops and just sort of widen the varieties of crops in there. Because it seems yeah. like it's pretty well everything you need to know is in there, but it would just be nice to have a more it to be more comprehensive. If that was a possibility, it'd be great. It's a discussion we have had. I know Gary, who isn't with us today, is really keen um, to uh, develop it further. So yeah, watch this space. It's something hopefully going forward in the next year or so that we will develop. Yes, I'm just going to upload this one onto the Google Drive as well. Okay. Tony, did you want to talk about risk assessments and uh, I do. I'm just laughing around trying to close this. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, oops. Sorry, I'm really struggling to. Don't worry. So, so there we are. Okay. That's, yeah. Um, so. I don't want to talk about risk assessments. I, I'm kind of aware um, that I'm sounding a bit like a stuck record uh, here in terms of looking at sort of risks and things like that. Um, and the only reason I do sound like a stuck record is that I have seen enough businesses that have really come across for reasons that they probably would not have done had they sat down and really thought about what the potential risks are. Um, so I'm just going to put up a, um, a template here, um, which again is a resource um, from the uh, from the CSA Network UK, um, and this is basically uh, just a, a framework. It, it just helps you organize your, your thoughts. So it's the, the question it's asking is, what is the risk? Um, who's affected and how? What are you already doing to manage that risk and, and limit its impact? How important is it? Um, what else can we do? And any, any comments? Now, I was gonna fill this out just uh, as an example, but actually I thought it would probably be much more interesting and useful um, if I ask you to do it. Um, so uh, if we just spend a couple of minutes and we, we'll just do one in each of these, 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 these categories. Um, so the first category that they identify where you might have risks are around your staffing and your, uh, and your, and your people. Um, so yeah, I'll throw it out there. Um, you know, first of all, what do you think the the risks are around uh, around around staffing? That's Joanna. Sorry, our hands up too too quick. I wasn't going to. If I saw people and I just put my hands up. It's actually nothing to do with check HR, but um, I can think of loads of risks where the um, where HR people got discipline, got to take take some employees through um, discipline uh, procedures due to neglect or miss. Um, uh, I think it's conduct, isn't it, at work. Okay, well, let's call that risk inappropriate behaviour. That sort of covers the. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so who's who? Who is affected by that? 
and how we see. Um, so is the impact that it has on the volunteers, if they were working on volunteers and also their teammates, is obviously is the relationship, working relationship has been impacted on the people where this mis inappropriate behavior has been acted upon. And, okay, and what are, what are you doing at the moment that would try and limit uh, that, that, that risk happening, that inappropriate behavior? Um, I know I don't have any at the moment. There is no HR right. policy. There's no employee. But if there yeah. is, there will be a HR policy and the manual um, that would go to um, uh, dis discipline. I call it HR procedures to follow. If there was one, you need one, I suppose. Yes. Oh yeah. And any other comments? And um, progresses and I mean that's 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 exactly it so if you didn't know it already um, which you possibly might have done going through this process you've now highlighted that you need some kind of procedure which enables you to deal with that that, that, that properly um, but, um, yeah I mean we'll do uh, we'll do one more um, that's yeah so let's go move on to financial risks. So what would be what would be a financial risk? Um, so it would normally be um, the, let's say um, your loan application gets rejected, for instance. I think there's a few have popped up in the chat, Tony. Oh, sorry. That's a, oh gosh, I, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard to you can't see, can you? Um, <laughs> Read it out for me. <laughs> yeah, polytunnels blowing away. That's a good one from Poppy. Definitely something that happens up here in North Wales quite a bit. Um, uh, communication. Um, how you can reduce um, conflicts. Uh, crop failure, definitely that was one I was thinking of was weather, thanks Marie. Um, okay, so again, um, as I say, this is, the, this is the last one we'll do here, but uh, you know, an example of, um, uh, of, of what could be affected um, and who could be affected by polytunnels blowing away. Could damage other equipment or damage houses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, and then uh, what do we do already to, to limit that risk? Again, shout out for me in the chat because I can't see it. And nothing in the chat. Installing polytunnels. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that's um, yeah. appropriate weatherproofing for location. <laughs> it seemed like Frank had really bad. Someone in Carmarthen had really bad um, polytunnel damage in one of the st storms last year. But I wonder if that was to do with the skins being a bit old. So maybe like renovating when needed the, the polytunnel skins. Okay, great. Good. And the risk of that happening, um, one to five. Depends on where you are. Okay. Two. Um, Yes. What else can we do? Um, maybe. Tony, yeah. I think I'm quite conscious of time now. I think yeah. uh, and anyway, Tom's anyway, got to go up for. That's yeah. So it's just a way of, of setting out and making sure that you systematically look at all the things that could go wrong. It's often called a risk assessment. I think maybe contingency planning um, is probably a better, um, uh, a better description for it. Right. Good. And the last thing 
that I wanted to look at um, was something called a sensitivity analysis. Um, I don't know if you have come across this, but essentially what sensitivity analysis enables you to do is to look at the impact that different things have on your bottom line, um, um, on your profitability. So the idea is that you keep everything else the same, change one thing and see what happens to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the bottom line. So for instance, uh, we're in a pandemic, um, seed supply is really tight and the cost of your seeds doubles. So I've expressed the change in percentage in decimal terms. So a doubling of the seed, we put one in there. That, um, sorry, at, at the moment, um, the, um, we, we, we've got about 2,000. So if we, if we double the cost of seed, our profit, um, the impact on our profit is about between five and five, five and six percent. So if we double our seed costs, the impact on our profitability is fairly small. And that tells you actually in the big scheme of things, you don't really need to worry too much uh, about seed costs. Let us um, look at something else. Uh, so for instance, labor, that is a, a big one. Um, at the minute uh, you're bringing in um, labor on the farm, uh, sort of 37 weeks of the year, 144 pounds uh, a, a week. I don't know, let's say you, I don't know, have an accident and bust your leg um, and you need to bring in uh, a person to cover your um to, to, to cover your work uh so for that reason let's say we have to double uh the amount of labor um so that would be 74 weeks um and you can see that's got a um that's oops no sorry i've done that wrong uh, so we have to double the the labor so that increase um uh, there is 10 percent it could build up to 100 percent um that would then reduce your profit by 15%. So that tells you that, that labor is actually quite an important part. On the other side, um, you might look at it and say, gosh, we're not making enough money. Um, what should we do? Well, I'll tell you what, let's increase the boxes. Let, let, let's increase our prices by 20%. Um, so that becomes 0.2. Um, and if you increase your boxes by your price by 20%, your profitability increases by about 26%. Um, so can you can you see the, the process that I that, that we're going through there? I don't want to labor the point, but it is quite a useful thing, which A tells you things you don't really need to worry about, uh, and B tells you the things that are important and and the impact of changing those by a particular. Uh, amount. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but it is actually quite a useful thing to do. Yes, definitely. Um, thanks, Tony. That's really useful, I think. And I think that definitely helps you um, work out how um, to uh, forecast your um, expenditures and, um, yeah, on your budget. Um, does anybody have any questions at this stage? I'm conscious that we have gone just over four. I know Tom has to leave like quite soon. So thank you so much, Tom, for all your um, input put today. And yeah, we will um, put everything on the Google Drive as well for everybody. Thanks a lot. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks. But yeah, hope it was really useful.
I wanted to say a special well done to Alice and Marie, who are both coping with young children at the same time. <laughs> You've done really well <laughs> to, yeah. to be able to follow things and, and for anybody else that's battling behind the scenes as well. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, Tracy, um, you mentioned about care farming in your initial comment. Are you in touch with wider social farms and gardens around their care farming, uh, growing care farming project? Yes. Sorry, you have to think. That. Yes, I am. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, yeah. And Alice, sorry if you've not got your hands too full. Can I ask you just a personal question on um, if you can send me some more information? Because I'm just based down in Pontypool, so I might be interested in becoming a member. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. It's not far at all. <laughs> Fabulous. Great. We'll do. Um, I, will, I will just. Um, say again as well it was in your joining email but um in the, the email that was sent out to you there is a feedback form but it's it's also um because of the funding through survey camera they need to evidence participants and obviously we can't get you to sign because we're not in person so there's a tick box on it that's really really important for you to um tick and then yeah if you can just fill that in for us we'd be very grateful Yes, it's in the place of a signature, isn't it? Just to yeah. confirm that you yeah. were present. Yeah. I will. I will email everybody again, um, just so we remind to remind everybody of it and make yeah. sure it gets done. Yeah. We'll send out the link. I'm just going to put the chat into the Google Drive as well, so everyone's got any links that were mentioned as the day went on, and there will be. Um, we'll upload the recording as well to YouTube. Um, and or post that somewhere so it, there's that's referred uh, and for certainly for for Alice and, and people like Zoe who had registered but weren't able to make it today for one reason or another it would give them the opportunity to watch watch again thanks Alice for that mention that uh, message conscious that we might not have well maybe skimmed over certain bits or might not have covered everything so please get in touch if there are things that you um want more information on um if you're based in wales obviously we can support you under the tevi camry mental and information scheme but um also um you know we will be holding more online um we're training and webinars and hopefully in the future we can do them face to face but um you know we're open to suggestions on any specific training mm. Um, that you would like as well so just let us know yes I guess that's an advantage with zoom that we can record it and yeah. send it out so geography doesn't matter but uh, and also, we'll see I think there'll be a mix going forwards I'm sure and also yeah I'm, I'm sorry that we can't offer the mentor scheme um, to people outside of Wales but definitely check um, what's available under the Land Workers Alliance and the UK CSA network because there are mental support um, available there. I have provided links, um, but also, um, you know, um, the Social Farms and Gardens website and membership is open to the whole of the UK as well. And we've got a wealth of resources online there. And also we have got other schemes running in England as well, um, which might provide certain support. Um, unfortunately, it's just kind of funding led at the moment. So, you know, there's care farming support in England, not in Wales. There's CSA support in Wales and not wow. in England. So we try and help as much as possible and we try and put as many of the resources online available to everybody. And also our Facebook page as well, which is very lively and um you know people often ask questions and get advice on there as well and it's a really good place to kind of share um what you're up to and promote things as well okay i think we're if well we need to bring this session to a close now so yes any final questions sarah will be right. sending out the final sort of email so please don't hesitate to get back in touch with us um, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. And I'd just say thank you so thank much you. to Tony as well for um, all your expert advice. That's, you're very <laughs> welcome. Uh, so I've also way. learned many things. I so say thank you all so much for contributing. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and thanks, Joanna, for all the lovely emojis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Brilliant. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very, very much. much. Bye bye. Bye.